guys, Matt here coming to you from Laid Laws, Harley Davidson. I'm also here with Nick. We're going to be talking about CVOs in the 2023 model year. And this year was a, an unusually good year, I would say. Some really good products that came out this year as well. But things were rolled out a little bit differently this year. And so I want to talk a little bit about how they were rolled out, how it was different than past years. And then Nick and I are going to kind of dive into, you know, all things CVO really. Talk about you know exactly what a CVO is, uh, what people expect from it, what Harley Davidson tries to accomplish with CVO, and, and what customers' expectations are when they're spending top dollar for a CVO. CVOs are the custom vehicle operation. They're Harley Davidson's top of the line, most premium motorcycles you can buy. So at the beginning of the model year, we saw one CVO, and every year Harley Davidson does a model launch video now, which usually comes out the end of January, and. It was 120 year anniversary this year and they rolled out the Road Glide Limited in the 120th uh, anniversary package. So it was a 120th anniversary bike. It was a CVO on the Road Glide Limited. Beautiful bike. Uh, I think the reception was really, really good. A lot of people liked it. And, you know, we're talking one of the most expensive bikes Harley's ever made at an MSRP of about $50,000. I think the CVO trikes, if I'm not mistaken, maybe were a little bit more when they came out. You remember the MSRP on those? Yeah, yeah I think, I, I don't remember exactly, but I, I'm pretty sure those were technically more expensive, but you can get away with saying it's the most expensive two-wheeled motorcycle All right. that Harley's ever made. For sure, it was, it's for sure that, um, outside of maybe like some exclusive racing thing that you might be able to buy, you know, as like a racing team or something. But for normal models, for regular consumers, I'm pretty sure that that was the most expensive two-wheel Harley ever. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. And when it first came out in, in the video, Brad Richards alluded to the fact that there would be more CVOs coming out in the future within the model year. So it was kind of a big hint saying that mid model year, we were going to get something else, right? Then come June, I think is when they gave us a, a teaser, a little sneak peek of the CVO road glide and street glide. They decided to, you know, roll out mid model year a huge massive change in the touring lineup um, these aren't your just your typical cvos that we've been seeing for the past five six years we have a brand new body style on these brand new infotainment new inverted front end uh stereo systems uh, i mean really the bike is a completely new generation in harley davidson's lineup and will forever be kind of a milestone year in harley davidson's history um, I, I think the 23 model year CVO road glide and street glide are going to be bikes that we talk about uh, probably forever in the history of, of the motor company. Um, and so kind of a big uh, departure from what is commonly referred to as the Rushmore fairing uh, and really the Rushmore touring bikes that came out in the 14 and 15 model year. Immediately when these were previewed and everything, there were some people in, in comments I got on my videos that said, well, you know, too bad for the people that bought the 120th anniversary CVO Road Glide Limited, right? And that was actually kind of my reaction at first as well. But then I got I got to thinking about it a little bit. And we're currently in the process of selling our second CVO Road Glide 120th anniversary uh, Limited. And so we didn't get that many. But I, I guess where I'm, what I'm going with this is there are definitely customers for that bike still, even though it's technically the old generation body style. And then there's customers that definitely prefer the newest generation body style as well. A, a couple of things. I mean, first kind of going back to the launch of the the anniversary bike itself, it was kind of a, an unusual launch just because I think we all expect to see at least a couple of CVO models. And so part of, I think why the bike maybe didn't, I mean, it was positively received, like you, you mentioned, but there was also just kind of a lot of question marks like, wait, suddenly like this is the only one. Um, and then, yeah, as you mentioned, that became a really big indicator. There was going to be something else coming that was probably more substantial, not just uh, what we've seen from a typical CVO. Although it's kind of, it's kind of, um, that's a, a discussion as well that we'll have a little bit later on, on like, should there be an assumption as to what a typical CVO is to begin with? Is that even what a CVO really, really is? But I, I think that every time a new product comes out, customers are always like, well, it sucks for the customers that bought last year or, or this, right? You know, if you're the guy who bought in, you know, 16, you didn't know that the next year was going to be a Milwaukee eight, you know, that doesn't mean you're not going to enjoy your twin cam bagger. Um, and if you're the guy who bought in, I can't remember if it was 19 or, or 20 when the new uh, boombox GTS system came out. Um, I think it was 19 cause you bought the last year. Right. Uh, I have an 18. The yeah, next you know, year. we all uh, made fun of Matt. Um, uh, but I don't think the average Harley customer really received the amount of, of, um, 
ridicule that you did um or just uh jest i should say not really ridicule but just uh you know razzing yeah uh most people would never receive that right and the reality is that the infotainment system is, is is still functional and no matter what if, you, if you're the kind of guy who's like well i'm just never gonna buy anything because i never ha- want to have a company come out with something new then you just don't really understand how companies work or or make products right, right? the idea is that every year there should be something better than what you come out with or something is bad because there's like some sort of stagnation going on yep. it is a little bit unusual that this came out halfway through the model year um as opposed to hey i just because you could literally be buying this bike you know at, while a newer generation is out and they are the same model year, you know, essentially, right? Because we have to imagine that all CVOs going forward, are, they're, you know, they're not going to not have the new fairing design. They're not going to build an, a CVO. Or, I mean, it's speculative, but I would have yeah. to assume that CVOs going forward are going to look like these two bikes, right? Yeah. Um, so you can theoretically buy one of the same model year, and that's a little unusual. I'll give you that. Um, but I also think that, you know, the CVO Road Glide Anniversary is a very classically styled bike, and so I don't think that necessarily the st- the, the the very futuristic looking uh, new bikes that I think will will kind of age into. I think Harley knows that if you're not pushing the boundaries a little bit on design, um, that your bike's going to come out and then within a couple of years, it's going to look dated. Um, so you've got to be on right on the forefront of what's acceptable in terms of your design, uh, push the limits just a little bit. Well, I don't think that a, a very classically styled CVO with... Um, you know, a nod to the old uh, Screaming Eagle, you know, uh, bird on the side and the chrome and the gold. Um, those are all like, they're beautiful and it works. We just had it out in the, in the light and I, you know, I hadn't seen one of them in the sunlight in a few months at least. And I was really taken aback by how striking that bike is. I just don't know if that, that if I'm ready to see that, that I, I think that almost works a little bit better on, on the, the older road glide fairing, just for me right now. You know, if you ask me that in five years, uh, I'll be like, no, the old, the old fairing looks dated. Um, and they should have done the new fairing, but right now, at least I look at it and I'm like, no, no, this, this, this hits, it hits in the right way. Um, in the same way that the the new CVO hits in a different way. Um, and so I think that they both have room to exist. Yeah, I I agree with you. You know, and I think just sitting on them today and, you know, going around and filming them today, um, the paint and some of the fit and finish things on the previous generations, we'll call it the Rushmore generation, 120th anniversary bike are actually better than the new generation CVO. Um, I mean, the the paint in the 120th is absolutely outstanding. I mean, it's like top tier, best of the best, like paint, the the detail and everything and the Eagle that you just mentioned. And um, I think too, that a lot of people, and this is one of those things in the the Harley Davidson world that I see year after, well, every time there's a major change in the Harley Davidson world, you know, whether it be the the Dyna change uh, in 2018 to all the soft tails or whether it be the Rushmore changes in 2014, 2015, or even the twin cam, you know, back in the late nineties, there's always going to be resistance to the new stuff. Um, I think probably more than most companies out there, you have people that just want that classic Harley Davidson. And so I think there's still going to be people that with both of these bikes existing together, being sold right next to one another on the showroom floor, you're still going to have people that still prefer the Rushmore generation CVO, you know, even at the higher price point, you know, you're talking about for the 120th anniversary CVO Road Glide Limited, you're talking about $50,000. And these Road Glide and Street Glide, the new generation, you're talking about $43,000 MSRP. So you're paying less and you're getting the, the new tech and the new generation bike. But, you know, maybe you're, you're compromising a little bit on, you know, some of the creature comforts like heated seats. Um, you know, obviously the tour pack and all the storage and everything comes with the 120th Road Glide Limited uh, and the paint, you know, and the exclusivity of an, it being a numbered bike in the 120th. And so there are things that I think some people probably will prioritize more than the newest, latest, and greatest tech. Um, that and, you know, it's kind of, you know, there's a lot of people that want to argue that, okay, well, I'm getting kind of the known entity as well. So far, the the new CVOs have been really good. People that have bought them have loved them. But there's still kind of that, that, that theory that people have, like, okay, we'll never buy the first year of something, you know. So... I think that they can coexist. Let's move on real quick, though, uh, to like a strong talking point when we talk CVO. For years, the CVOs have always had the biggest motor, you know, in the lineup. And the 120th anniversary CVO Road Glide Limited has 117 cubic inch motor. And when the STs came out a couple of years ago, that was kind of a big point of uh, maybe contention. People were saying, wow my CVO that I'm spending $40,000 plus on 
no longer has the biggest motor in the lineup. You've now got the Rogue Glide ST, the Street Glide ST, the Lowrider ST, and even the Lowrider now that have the exact same displacement, right? What do you think, Nick? Do you think that the CVO should always have a bigger engine than all the other bikes? Or do you think it's okay for some of these bikes, you know, that are in the lower tier that aren't CVOs to have the same 117? You know, I'm not a CVO buyer, so I might not be the most, uh, not because I, I wouldn't own one, um, but uh, for a whole host of reasons. But um, that is all to say that I guess for me, uh, the size of the engine doesn't really matter that much. I'm more concerned with the either measurable or the more intrinsic values, right? So uh, what's, the what's the performance of the motor or what's the character of the motor, you know? And, but I, I can understand the CVO guy's argument, you know, where it's like, look, I paid the most, I want the most. Okay, cool. I understand that. And, you know, if you're buying the CVO because it's the top of the line and it's the most exclu exclusive, well, you could argue, and I'm sure Harley would, that the 117 you know, at that point until the 121 was the top of the line. It was the big dog motor. And just because it's in something else doesn't mean it isn't still the big dog motor. It isn't the top of the line. Um, but I also understand the CVO's uh, mentality or the CVO and owner mentality of, well, I want mine to be exclusive. And I think that um, that kind of really does uh, talk a little bit about or get into, you know, what is a CVO and who is a CVO buyer and what do they expect from a CVO? Because I think exclusivity is, is part of that. Um, and, uh, because, you know, we know that if you put a 114 on a one next to a 117 on a dyno, um, they're 5% they're, more power. Yeah. Not, not a, yeah, not a huge difference. And it makes sense. Even if you just look at the numbers, I mean, three cubic inches is, I mean, I don't know what the exact CCs on that is. That's probably like maybe like 50 CCs or something or like lawnmower or something difference. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, it's a very minimal difference. Um, you know, and I've, I've ingest, you know, talked about the fact that, you know, well, what is Harley going to do about the Pan Am? I mean, the Pan Am makes 50 more horsepower than the CVO does. I mean, why aren't CVO owners upset about that? They're upset about right. three cubes, but they're not upset about 50 more horsepower. The Pan it's Am all about the number on the side. Nick. Yeah, it doesn't the, matter how much they're producing like, power wise. Yeah, so that's what, that's why you can't ask me that question. Cause I'll just go into a rage. I'm like 50 more horsepower. That's way more like that should be the number you're upset about. If you're upset about the bigger number, 50% but, more power, right? Yeah. But it doesn't count. Cause it's, it's the Pan Am for some reason it doesn't count. Right? Yeah. Okay. But I get that. So I, I get the sentiment on both sides, but for me, I think it's less to do with the number and it's, it's honestly more to do with exclusivity and you can achieve the exclusivity in a variety of ways and easy ways, three more cubes, um, and that's a very, as you said, the number on the side, it's a very easy and, and identifiable way, a way, um, they've done it now in two ways with the new CVO, right? So not only is it cubes, but it's also variable valve timing. So it's got both more displacement and more tech, which is pretty cool. Um, but you know, I, I don't think it's been, I think it's something that kind of goes away and people forget about a little bit, you know, the, uh, CVOs for a long time had 110 you know, uh, twin cams and the low rider S did as well. Um, and people love the low rider S. They don't really talk about that. I don't really see current 110 owners complaining all the time about the low rider S. I mean, I think it's one of those things that initially it's a small gripe and, and you move on from it, but I think it's would be smart marketing for Harley to make sure that the CVOs are always seen as very, very exclusive. And the motor is one way to do that. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about exclusivity and, and what people expect from a CVO. So I think some people do, like I mentioned before, do expect the biggest motor out of a CVO. You know, some people probably don't care. Like Nick said, you know, we actually saw the Fatboy S and the Lowrider S back in the 2016 model year, right? Um, when slim S. You could go there's real a fast slim on S a Slim. Too. Forgot about that bike. Yeah, so those have the exact same 110 cubic inch twin cam motor. I think people forget about that. And so Harley Davidson has done this before. It's not like this was the first time with the ST models in the 22 model year, whenever they came out. Um, but let's talk real quick about what else you get with the CVO. And I think sometimes people forget about this because I think some people, they do just prioritize power and performance, which is fine. You know, if you're a power guy, great, it's more power to you. But, you know, there's things like infotainment. Uh, there's things like uh, stereo, the p &A that's all over the hand controls, foot controls, uh, the fancy paint on the bikes, uh, the communication stuff, the headsets, the locking of the bags, the uh, body work, you know, that's something that's a big deal to me. You know, I th I've always think that in the car world, you know, it's, it's, it's really cool when companies go through the trouble of doing different body work and in the bike world too, you know, cause it's, you know, as, as important as paint is, and that's something that Harley doesn't get enough credit for. And even just little details like the engine casing being 
powder coated in a different finish. You know, I don't know what the cost of that is, but I know if you wanted to replicate it, it would be outrageously expensive. Um, but you know, the CVOs were the first to get stretch bags and they had their own unique fender with their own unique tail lights and, um, usually have sometimes a unique front fender as well. They usually have unique tank trim, you know, on the gas tank. And this year with the new CVOs, obviously with all the new body work, they have new gas tank, all sorts of, of unique pieces like that. And if you go back to like the CVO breakout, uh, very unusual like tubes coming off the tank. Um, just really interesting and unique details that I think are important for making the bike look visually distinct and custom. You know, I mean, that's in the name, custom vehicle operations. The bike yep. should look fairly custom when it's next to a standard model. And that's not just PNA, you know, it's gotta be things like the Fang spoiler. Um, and yep. it, it sets trends, you know? Um, and, and, and the question then becomes, you know, well, paint's easy to keep exclusive to a certain extent. You'd have to hire a custom painter, right? You, and Harley doesn't really sell usually a, a full CVO paint set. You know, even the paint, like the touch-up paint sometimes like is, is VIN-locked, you know, kind of thing. But the body work is kind of harder, I think, sometimes for Harley to keep exclusive because, you know, an aftermarket company can buy the Fang spoiler, you know, uh, or can buy a bike with a Fang spoiler, take it off, replicate it, and then sell that body panel or that, you know, fairing or whatever it may be. Um, so I get why Harley sometimes immediately adds CVO parts to their PNA catalog. I think that, you know, it's important for Harley to make sure that the CVOs are coming with things that can't be uh, replicated easily by the aftermarket or just would be so expensive or so much trouble that they would never do that. Um, you know, I, I was, I, I wouldn't stop talking earlier today when we were talking about this video, I kept mentioning the dash trim on the gas tank uh on the 2020 through maybe 2022 cvos at least 21 and 22 like the blue steel um era cvo uh the the trim on that tank is absurd and i, I don't know if you got footage of it or if you'll have to go through your archive but it's like it, it literally looks like you 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 know chopped up uh you know thor's hammer um uh, and then you like uh put charred chrome steel on it like it looks like a solid hunk of metal and it's backlit you know I don't care how much money you've dumped into your performance bagger. You probably don't have that on your gas tank. And when the CVO owner rolls up next to you, he's going to know that he's got something that you couldn't even buy if you wanted to basically. Yeah. Um, and that, that kind of stuff is important uh, to me. Uh, not, in, not only in terms of the exclusivity, but the fit and finish, all that kind of stuff that pretty much no one else can replicate. Um, I think that's where Harley should be focusing um, and they've done a pretty good job of that overall. Um, but I did notice on like the new CVO, a regression in certain ways, um, as you mentioned, yeah. um, where the paint's a little simplistic this year on one of the models. Uh, yeah, I think that dark platinum to your point is probably the most simplistic CVO paint I've ever seen yeah. you know, ever. And, you know, other things make up for it. You know, although, I mean, it can be overlooked very easily on those bikes because there's just so much new content yeah. on those motorcycles. And I was able to talk to HD, um, uh, when I was at the this internal event that they were doing, um, I was able to talk to one of the designers and one of the the uh, lead for for paint, uh, and uh, she explained that, and, and this is probably interesting for some of you that the reason that that was chosen, that color was specifically chosen, is because of the way that the light falls off at different angles. So basically, um, we all know this intrinsically. We look at different colors; they look different in different lights and from different angles. Um, and so, certain colors hide that more than others. You know. Uh, certain colors tend to hide body lines on cars um, or, or bikes and certain ones tend to uh, really showcase that. And since there were so many new body panels on the bike, they really wanted a color that, that had a lot of light to dark fall off uh, and contrast to highlight those body lines. Um, and so that's why they chose the dark platinum. Uh, because if you look at like the whiskey uh, or uh, the whiskey neat, the, the new body work is a lot less visible. Um, it's a beautiful paint scheme and the bike's beautiful and gorgeous, but um, the intricacies of the the new tank because it's it's not just a round shape anymore are a little bit more lost because the the whiskey neat actually uses those body lines for the pinstriping and that kind of stuff and so yeah. it looks just like the paint that's doing that shape as opposed to the actual body lines so i get why they did it but as you said it's it's probably one of the most simplistic paint schemes that we've had um in a long time because it 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 looks like a really nice gray, like a really nice platinum. Yeah. Um, it's not as visually striking as even the solid color ones that we've seen, like uh, blue steel, I think is a little bit more visually striking um, with the type of pearl that it has in it. Um, yeah, definitely. So. Yeah, or like the Mako Shark Fade. I mean, that's 
pretty much one solid color for the entire bike, but yeah. it has fading you yeah. know, attributes in the bike to kind of make it a little bit more like premium nature. I, I can't remember. What's but the name of the color on the, the limited uh, that was the silver mag fade? Magnetic fade. Yeah. Andrew was all about that bike. Oh, the magnetic gray fade. They still roll up and yeah. I still see them in the parking lot. I'm like, oh my God. You know, yeah, and, and to nice. see that next to the brand new CVO, because um, we didn't have them out at the same time, but we had one on the floor and a guy rolled up on the magnetic gray fade and I looked at it and I'm like, okay, well, I mean, probably would have showed the body lines with a magnetic gray fade too but yeah. um you know yeah well so um you know another topic i wanted to bring up too is you know sometimes people you know kind of going back to the engine thing people will say okay well, well buy, why buy the cvo if it doesn't have a bigger motor than some of the bikes that are 10 fifteen thousand dollars less and you know what i basically just alluded to with nick a second ago is because there's there's a lot more there than just the engine size it's the biggest engine size or maybe equally as big as some of the other bikes but really you're buying a cvo because of all the extra stuff you get on the bike if you don't appreciate all the extra stuff on the bike maybe you're not a you know a pna guy with the fancy grips and the heated seat and all the fancy paint and everything if you don't value that stuff don't get the cvo you know i tell people this every day they say well why would i pay forty three thousand dollars I'm not really talking so much about the new CVO Road Glide and Street Glide that came out because those have 121 cubic inch and they're pumping out 139 foot pounds of torque or whatever it is. Um, so they're clearly the performance leader now um, in the Milwaukee 8 uh, realm. But, you know, in years past, I tell people, you know what, you know, build up, you know, buy, a, buy an ST or buy a 114 motor and do a stage three, st stage four kit on it. Uh, you're going to spend less money. And if all you care about is going the fastest out of all your buddies, maybe the CVO is not for you. Um, but let's talk real quick about, you know, exclusivity, Nick. You know, I, I think, and we'll talk a little bit about what what your opinion is on, on what Harley tries to do with their CVOs. Um, something that I've seen in the past is Harley Davidson a lot of times will launch certain PNA items. Maybe it's the Kahuna collection, for example. Um, I believe in the 19 model year, the Kahuna collection was first introduced on the CVOs. And so that model year, if you bought a CVO, you got this brand new, rips which were beautiful by the way i think the kahuna collection is probably one of the nicest collections harley it still looks good like a yeah. ca nice kahuna primary just a little red bar and shield it's tasteful it looks good yeah so you got that and then uh, i think it was probably the 20 model year so the very next model year they then offered it in the parts and accessory catalog so for at least one year you got exclusivity with those parts and there's a lot of parts on the cvo bikes that are VIN restricted meaning you can't order those parts unless you have a CVO VIN that you can tell the parts guy over the counter. And Harley Davidson, I think in the past has introduced these new parts on CVO and then has kind of trickled those parts down. Do you feel like that's kind of their objective or do you think like that's a good way of introducing new parts is, is make them exclusive for a year on the CVO. And then after a year, um, and let me add, add to that as well. A couple of years ago in the 20, was it the 22 or a year, a lot of people were up in arms about oh, there's now Gunship Gray available on regular road glides. Yeah. And everybody bought, who bought a CVO in the 18 model year that bought Gunship Gray were up in arms about how their color is no longer exclusive. We actually had Brad Richards here, who's the, the VP of Styling Design, sitting in Nick's chair, and he basically said, Harley Motor Company has always done that. It's just that people didn't notice it because there's never really been a color. That was, that that was hit that hard. A, yeah, yeah, hit that hard in that much of a spotlight that yeah. people noticed it right away. Well, it had the right name too, you know. Like, Same name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It had the right, well, and, and I think that that color in particular had like, um, had an old like a uh, following behind it, you know. And it was, it was, you know, really coming on strong in the auto industry too at, yep. at a similar time and, so yeah, uh, just the name, you know, just hit. Yeah, I, 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 people were still calling it Battleship Gray. Like they just are so <laughs> yeah. excited, you know, like Gunship Gray, Battleship Gray. They just love that name. Um, because if yeah. I, I think we talked about this at the time, it's like if Harley just when it came out in the twenty one model year, if they just called it uh, Billiard Gray, like what we have right now, which is a very similar color, mm -hmm. people would have been like, well, it's a copy of Gunship Gray, but they probably wouldn't. Uh, there wouldn't have been as much fretting, you know, because mm -hmm. their color still would have been exclusive and and somewhat different. Different name, yeah, yeah. Um, but to get back to your, your your bigger question about exclusivity and and when things could should come out and how, to what degree there should be a trickle down to regular models and to what degree there should be um, a PNA offering of CVO exclusive stuff, I think it, it varies a lot from part to part. You know, I think um, it would be really unfortunate to never offer the performance side of things or um, the uh, you know the the comfort side of things to the non CVO owners, right? Like I think it's 
and, and maybe there's some good engineering reason for this, but it's for me, it's kind of bugged me that there's still no power locking bags um, either available through PNA or on some of the standard models like the limited. You know, the CVOs had that exclusive for long enough, and I get the the fact where you don't want to ship it from the factory because then you got to give them a clicking, you know, fob. So I, I get that there might be some engineering concerns behind it, but I just think that there probably would have been a way to figure it out by now. And it's such a nice uh, feature to have, and it's been exclusive on the CVOs for so long that it just seems silly that it hasn't, you know, migrated down in some way to the regular bikes. Um, and so stuff like that, you know, I think making that available, it's not something people are going to be bragging about. If someone wants to spend the money to do it, let them do it. On the other side of things, like the the dash that I mentioned on the tank for the CVOs, that's something that I think should never be trickled down. Like it should never go down to something else. It should always be exclusive because that is a fit and finish thing that, um, and an exclusivity thing and a badging thing that there's no real reason to ever trickle that down. The customer that doesn't have that isn't missing out in any other way than just not having the CVO experience. There's no additional like utility there, basically. Um, and a lot of stuff falls on a spectrum somewhere between those two things, whether it's suspension or whether it's the engine or whether it's, um, you know, paint or graphics or colors. And I think that, um, you know, uh, you can kind of make a, a, a decision by decision basis uh, on some of those parts. You know, some of the things too, just if you don't offer it, then the aftermarket's going to instantaneously offer it. And you're just, if you're Harley, you're just throwing money away and, or you're giving people a subpar product. You know, I, they for a long time protected the barn shield outline badge. And I still, I think protect that from mm -hmm. the, from the 18, 19, the gunship CVO era. Yeah. Um, just the outline of yeah, the badge. Dude, there is the a the tank. massive, uh, black market now for <laughs> guys that make those badges basically. Yep. Right. Yeah, um, we've, and we've bought a couple here at the shower. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Maybe. definitely. Or they, we got them, you know, they, they fell off a truck or something. Um, <laughs> yeah. did Harley really protect the CVO customer from that badge? Not for being out there. Not for very long, yeah. you know. All yeah. they did was throw that money away and create a black market. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that was the right call in that particular instance. And I think that a lot of products are like that. You know, some are harder to replicate than others. Almost everything on a CVO falls somewhere on the spectrum between keep it exclusive forever because there's no reason for anyone to have it. And um, look, we don't want to keep bag locks uh, exclusive forever because who cares about bag locks other than it's a really nice feature to have. If you want to pay for it, pay for it, right? There's no... There's not like, it's not a brag point, you know, it's not even like an engine. An engine's a brag point, right? I have the 121 mm -hmm. with variable valve timing. You can't buy that unless you buy a CVO, right? Yeah. I haven't seen a CVO owner going like, ha look at my bags unlock, you know, right. like, unless you're just like, you know, razzing your friend because he has to take his barrel key out, you know, but yeah. I don't think that's a good reason to gatekeep something. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I, and I wonder too, if it has something to do with like the wiring harnesses, like how, like when you, when you make when you build the bike on the production line, there's something that has to be installed very yeah. early on and to ch try to buy something over the counter and then install it after the fact. Yeah, I'm sure it, it has. Be. Yeah, I'm sure it has something. That, uh, I'm sure there's a good engineering reason for that. But sometimes there's yeah. stuff that's CVO exclusive that really doesn't need to be CVO exclusive yeah. um, for as long as it is. And it should be in the PNA item catalog. And it just isn't for some reason. Um, and I'm sure that Harley has tried to avoid that as much as possible because I know they just know it's leaving money on the table. Um, and so that's not the most common problem. But um, yeah, everything's on a spectrum. You know, how long should we keep it exclusive? I think uh, is a good question, but I think it's a case by case basis for what part it is that we're talking about. Yeah. You know, another topic uh, that we talked about when we were downstairs is the, the different models and cycling models out in and out of the CVO lineup. For a long time in the early 2000s, we saw a lot of soft tails and different models being cycled in and out of the CVO lineup. But really since 2010, 2011, we've seen just a lot of road glides, street glides, and limiteds. And, you know, one thing that Nick and I both agreed on earlier was, you know, we would definitely like to see more soft tails in the lineup. Um, you know, personally, I think like a, a lowrider ST CVO, I think would absolutely just kill it in the marketplace. You know, we did see the El Diablo, which is an icon that we saw a couple of years ago in the 22 model year that was extremely popular. Um, and, you know, they limit those to about 1500 bikes. And I think we only got like two or three of those things all model year long, which, you know, we could sell a lot more. Um, I think I like the fact that they do keep the icons to a very limited uh, production number, but I think a, a way to kind of unlock, you know, more people being able to enjoy a bike like that would be to put something like that on in a CVO trim. So personally, I would like to see a little bit more of a mix up, maybe, um, maybe put the street glide and or road glide on a one year hiatus, even though I think those are probably the most logical choice for a CVO trim. You know, give it maybe just a one year yeah. you know, break and then bring it back the next year. Yeah, I'd like to see Harley-Davidson switch things out a little bit. 
you know, when we talk about what Harley should do when it comes to, you know, what bikes should be given the CVO treatment and that kind of stuff, I think that that really does also link to another conversation point that I, I wanted to talk to you about, or just another topic for the video that I think is really important, which is, you know, we're talking a lot about right now, what does the CVO mean to the customer, right? Well, okay, they're getting the most power, they're getting the most exclusive bike, they're getting the best paint, they're getting all the, the stuff, right? That's a cons really a consumer focused side of things, right? But um, what about what does it mean to the motor company? What is why does the motor company want to build it other than just, well, we get to build a, an expensive bike and customers get to, to buy it, right? We get to make money, right? But um, that's not the only reason why you do stuff. You know, it's not the only reason why you do something as a company. Um, uh, sometimes you, you're, you're doing something cause there's other, uh, associated things that are important when you're only doing the baggers as CVOs, you're, you're kind of doing yourself a disservice because the CVO is really important for showcasing product, for showing, showcasing technology, for showcasing what you're capable of. But you know, the baggers are long distance tourers and, uh, you know, that's not the only segment that Harley lives in these days, you know? Uh, you know, they've got performance uh, muscle cruisers in the soft tail lineup that are some months for us, at least, and I'm not sure it's true across the country, outselling a lot of bagger models. Uh, maybe not always the Street Glide and the Rogue Glide Special and ST, but it's definitely trading blows with those on a pretty, pretty regular basis. And, you know, while they've done some interesting one off models trying to hit certain target audiences like the FXDR, I think that they might be better served highlighting and giving the CVO treatment to a bike like the Lowrider ST that you mentioned, or even the Lowrider S, you know, instead of putting a, you know, all of that money into developing a lot of bespoke parts for a bike that's kind of more of a question mark as to how the public's going to receive it. The cool thing about the CVO treatment is you're taking a bike that you already know is wildly popular, the Rogue Glide, right? And you're just putting the, the coolest stuff on it. You're building the most bitchin' version of it. And you know, it's going to sell because it's the coolest version of your already cool bike, right? Yeah, yeah. There's no gray area. There's no question mark as to whether it's going to do well. And so something like the Lowrider S, I feel like is such a prime candidate for something like that because you know that if you put the bigger motor in it, you put, I don't know, maybe you go wild, you carbon fiber fairing or fenders or tank or something, and you put the aluminum swing arm that you had on the FXDR on there, and you maybe rob the Pan Am of its electronic suspension and its uh, dual disc Brembos, you know, and... and yeah, you go wild. You take the forged wheels the FXDR had, right? You take a lot of the parts off the XDR, uh, FXDR, actually, and, and and you make them work for the, the CVO lowrider. Oh, I mean, that'd be a money printer for us, at least. I don't know <laughs> yeah. if it'd be a money printer in, in other parts of the country, but... You can charge whatever you want for that bike. Oh, yeah. sell out of them. <laughs> we basically build bikes like that all the time. You know, and anytime that we're constantly getting orders for bikes, like custom bikes, whether, you know, customers want us to do all this stuff to their Lowrider S is full carbon. I mean, you guys have seen our Coast Glides and that kind of stuff. Anytime that we're filling a, a niche like that, it's for us a pretty obvious answer that um, that, that niche could be filled by the motor company as well. And yeah. in many cases... The reason that makes me so excited is not because we don't enjoy building the Coast Glides, but because we don't have the R&D and the budget and, and the endless resources of the motor company. I mean, I shouldn't say it's endless, but near endless compared to us. You know, we are a small fish compared to what the motor company can do. Yeah. I mean, you got to have a customer that has really deep pockets for us to build one. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's I'd love to sell a lot more of those bikes, uh, right. but at the price point that we can sell them at because we're hand making them out of the back, you know? Yeah. Um, it's we're, just, we're double the price that the motor company could exactly could retail it to a customer for. Yeah. And so I just think that there's, there's potential for a bike like that. And, you know, to go back to the icon too, for a second that you mentioned, you know, those are, those in my opinion have almost become more exclusive in some ways than, than the CVOs have. And I'm not saying that CVOs need to be as exclusive as the icons or need to all be numbered or whatever, but it would be cool to see that kind of treatment, some sort of more synergy between between those two two lineups I, I think that they they represent their own distinct niches you know the cvo and, and the icon bikes it'd be cool to see a sign, kind of an overlap you know the anniversary uh, cvo is kind of like that it's an overlap between a numbered anniversary bike with the numbered or with a uh, a color themed paint to match other models for the year and a cvo you know there's some some interesting overlap there i think that there's maybe a, a market for that on on the cvo and the icons uh, as well um It'd be cool to see like a themed CVO that's going back and hearkening back to an older model. Um, that might be cool. Yeah. An icon CVO? Basically, yeah. <laughs> that might uh, be cool. And because, you know, that, that, and that lends itself to the exclusivity again. You know, I think yeah. that a lot of people like numbered bikes and, and it's just cool. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think maybe the reason that they don't do as many CVO soft tails is that they're worried that there's not a budget for it. You know, sometimes they're like, well, you know, a bagger can more easily absorb 
the amount of money that they're spending on the CVO because you know they're spending more money on the paint, you know, whether they're doing it or Gunslinger's doing it. You know they're spending more money on the PNA and and the finishing of the casing and all these other things. So I get, you know, that the larger MSRP of the bagger to begin with can better absorb that. But as always, if you just build a solid product that people want, people will figure out a way to buy it and, and pay for it. And so, you know, I think more CVOs on the most popular models that they build, in addition to the Street Glide and Road Glide, but something like the Lowrider ST, um, or the low rider, uh, the really other popular models in their lineup are prime targets for that, regardless of what you end up having to charge for them. You know, worry less about that and worry more about making a product people really, really, really want. 100%. Yeah. We kind of talked a little bit about that when we talked about our, our Harley Davidson's overpriced. Yeah. And Nick and I kind of both agree that, you know, if you build something that's in high demand, then people will pay for it. You know, yeah. people will gladly pay for it as long as, you know, within reason, you know, as long yeah. as they feel like you're getting, you know, a good value. But yeah, that that's kind of what Nick and I think that is, is the best way to go. Just build what people want, build something cool, and they'll be happy to pay the money, especially if it to build that same thing in the aftermarket would cost more. You know, if you're saving money and getting that same product that, that you would want to build in the aftermarket, then it, it's a it's a win win. Yeah. And um, if you're looking closely at the CVOs, they've always been that value proposition. Yeah. Whether whether you see the value or not is kind of the question, right? But yeah. Um, when you factor in the paint and the motor and the electronic bags and the suspension and, 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 you know, uh, the upgraded speaker system, I mean, the sound systems on these, these bikes, if you want to replicate it and oftentimes they're sold over the counter, I mean, there's thousands of dollars just right then and there, you know, yeah, it's like three grand, 3,500 yeah. right there. Uh, you know, you're, you're already 35% of the way to the, the 40,000, $41,000 CVO MSRP just by factoring the sound system, you yeah. know, uh, and that doesn't even start on half the other stuff that's on there. So they've always been a, a good value proposition for the guy who likes all those things. So I don't, I'm not always worried about that side of things. So it's always going to be better than, than what you can do piecemealing, especially when you factor in labor in the aftermarket. Yeah. What I was going to say earlier was, you know, you, you talked about what the CVOs are to the motor company, not just what they are to the consumer. And, you know, dare we say sometimes Har Harley Davidson uses them as like halo bikes where they throw their, the best of the best at the CVOs, like whether it be Rockford Fosgate speakers, you know, they've got those two piece lace wheels. We haven't really touched on wheels yet, but usually wheels are something that's very exclusive to the CVOs, at least at first, you know, things like the Tomahawk wheel or the fugitive wheel, they'll offer it in the PNA catalog later. But usually when the wheels on a CVO are always, always exclusive to just the CVO, which really changes the whole look of the bike, really. I mean, the wheels are a big thing, you know, from a profile standpoint, you know, what the bike looks like. You know, there's obviously a lot of speculation right now as to what is going to come of all these changes that were made to the road glide and, and street glide CVOs. You know, people are already speculating, okay, is this stuff going to trickle down? When's that going to happen? Is Are the CVOs next year going to look different? Are they going to be the same? And so, you know, we don't really know that, but it's it's always interesting when you come out with a bike as as different and with so much new tech and content like they did this year with these CVOs. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen something this new mid model year, you know? And so this is kind of an unprecedented time in Harley Davidson's history in terms of these new CVOs that have been launched on Harley Davidson's premier bread and butter platform, which is the Turing chassis. And so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see just how much of this CVO eventually trickles down to the regular bikes and what time frame that's going to happen in. Yeah, it's um it's definitely very interesting. You know, I think that we we get kind of complacent sometimes in how we view these products and and you know, we stare at them all day every day. Um but uh yeah, the CVOs, the new ones are just are they're a radical departure in many many ways. You know, they they fit the same roles and the and the heritage and the legacy of the bike is still clearly there, but there's very few things on that bike that aren't touched um from from the previous iteration of it the frame and the rear fender right essentially yeah <laughs> even the things that are substantially similar are, are different you know in in important ways like the transmission you know with the the different uh, shift drum and it's it's easier and smoother to operate um so it'll be interesting to see what does trickle down and it's going to be kind of a fine line and and you know you hope that they are able to do it in a way where people don't feel like they're just protecting the cvo you know for arbitrary reasons and instead are, are really trying to give everyone at every budget the best possible value for their dollar because i think that's when when people are going to be happiest you know not that they they feel like they're getting a cut down cvo right but that they're getting an upped um version of the bike that they would have been able to buy a couple years ago but now yeah. it's just better so I, I think the question arises do we feel like it's a good idea for the harley davidson motor company to release things mid-model year 
And I think there's some pros and cons there. I think the pros are is you keep, you know, generating the hype around the the brand and continuously coming out with new stuff more than just one time a year. I think it's really a good thing. I like the fact that, you know, sometimes mid model year we'll see the icon come out or every year there's an enthusiast paint job that usually comes out mid model year. And so it's, it's nice to be able to generate that hype around the brand more than just one time a year when all the models are launched at the same time. Now, are there cons to this as well? Yeah, potentially. You know, it, it would have been nice to have had the entire model year to sell these CVOs, which by the way, you know, Harley Davidson actually produced a pretty healthy amount of the CVO Road Glide and Street Glide. You know, most of the people that have wanted this bike, we've been able to get one for them, which I can't always say you know, about years past, a lot of times the CVOs, once they go, they're gone. People are looking for one, you know, we've, we've got a couple on the floor right now. And so, you know, in, in the one color anyways, yeah, I, I see pros and cons. Again, I, I like the fact that Harley's co always coming out with something new. You never know, you know, what's going to come out. Do people not like that sometimes because they'll buy one thing and then something else will come out right around the corner. Yeah. But you know what? That's, that's life. You know, you know, every year Apple's going to come out with a new iPhone as well. You know, is that going to keep you from buying the, the 15 or whatever it is? Yeah. No, you buy it, you enjoy it. And just know that a company is the only way for them to, to stay alive is to keep making better and better and better. Yeah. And I think that, um, I really like the mid model year launches for the icons and for, uh, even bikes that maybe plan to keep around for a few years. Um, you know, a few, three, you know, five years, maybe, maybe if it's a, a great model, you'll refresh it and launch it again, um, after five years. But, um, I think with the CVO this year, I was a little disappointed in it being a mid-model year because, one, we typically get CVOs after they're announced. There's always a delay, right? Um, it's not usually like the CVOs are announced and then those are the first ones off the truck. They always take a little bit longer. But two, because it, it, with this particular model only lasting a year, it means that we really only have six months of, of selling time and the factory has less production time. And I don't know if that was an indi or a, a reason why we got a lot fewer of the um, whiskey neats than we were hoping for. But I do know that if you run into any difficulties and you're only making these bikes for a year and what's effectively actually six months if you're launching them in June is that you're, you, you don't have a lot of wiggle room. Um, and then the exclusivity question changes as well. Anything that's exclusive on these bikes isn't really exclusive for a year um, in the same way it would be um, because effectively the new models are going to be launched unless your CVOs are always a mid model year launch. The other thing too, is that you, you really give your customers a short window of time to buy it before the winter seasons there, you know? So, I mean, a lot of the guys that have been, you know, on our uh, deposit list for uh, whiskey neat bikes are, I mean, luckily they're in Southern California, but if they were in a dealership in, in a place with, uh, you know, heavy winters, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to ride it until uh, long, like almost a year after they probably yeah. bought it, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I just don't think that's optimal. Now, if you're launching something like, you know, an icon where you're only building 1500 of them, you're every day, there's only going to a couple of them. Yeah. It's, it's a different equation. It helps build some hype. It's a cool thing to get you in the news cycle, but it's not your main, one of your mainstay products. And the CVO baggers are a mainstay product. They are the top of the line. And I think that they should be available for purchase for the customer who wants them, you know? Uh, they're exclusive in the form of how expensive they are. Um, they're not, they shouldn't be in my opinion, exclusive just because the factory couldn't make, make enough of them of a particular color, you know, because they didn't give themselves a large enough window. And I'm not saying that's what happened. This is all speculatory. They don't, they don't tell me anything, but, um, I do know that they left themselves less room for error this way. And, yeah. and I don't know if it, if it benefits them any more than, than just, if this had been icons or something, you know? Yeah. I mean, we do know that the whiskey neats have taken a little bit longer for to get here yeah. and we've received far fewer of the whiskey neat, which I think it was kind of done by design yeah. uh, just because the paint is all hand done by gunslinger and they're just, they're harder pr to produce. But yeah, right. no, I think, yeah, uh, that's uh, awfully a good discussion on CVOs. Anyways, guys, yeah, uh, kind of an interesting year this year, some really big stuff in, in terms of CVOs this year. Uh, probably one of the better years, more monumental years that I've seen in a very long time. I always talk about this. We saw a really big shift in the 2018 model year where I think you know, the designers at Harley Davidson really started pouring more exclusive content into the CVOs, you know, things like the Fang spoiler, um, which came out, I think, in the 19 model year, actually. But, you know, wheels and you know, really cool paint and things like that. Um, and Harley Davidson is, you know, up the game again this year with the new Rogue Glide and Street Glide and you know, the new body style, which is it's a huge moment at Harley Davidson's history. In the comment section, let me know if you guys were someone who has bought one of these new CVO Road Glider Street Glide. 
you know, share your experiences. I'm, I'm going to be buying something with the new body style either this year or next year. I don't, I don't know what, but um, I got to ride them in Sturgis around the Black Hills. It was a blast. If you guys haven't already seen my full review on the bike, I'm going to link it in the top right-hand corner here, so be, be sure to check that out. Me and the boys got to ride them when we were in Sturgis this year, so that was a lot of fun. But um, yeah, thanks for joining me, Nick. It's always good to kind of talk shop and explore the CVOs, and this is a kind of a topic that I get a lot of comments on. You know, people, when they are spending top dollar and they expect the best from Harley-Davidson, there are certain things that they expect in terms of exclusivity and performance and stuff like that, so it's always good to kind of explore these things. And yeah, there's a lot of strong opinions. Thank uh, you. That's what I was good. for. Yeah, there's a lot of strong opinions and, that, and, that, and that's how it should be you know yeah. uh and and you know they they really are like, giving a, a passion and i think too that i might have has come off a little bit negative around cvos or just maybe not as overtly positive i'd like to be i, I had a chance to ride the new bikes not in sturgis but uh, the new cvos are incredible like yeah. they're absolutely incredible and and almost everything on the bikes uh I love the direction that they went with them. Uh, you guys ride in Milwaukee, which is almost as good, right? Yeah, they're almost, in my mind, kind of victims of their their own success with me because I see what they did with those, and I'm like, oh, man, you guys could be doing this with so many other things, you know? You guys could be doing CBO of the Low Rider uh, S or ST, you know? You could be doing CBOs a lot of stuff, and so for me, it's like it, the new bikes and and the level of changes and the level of, of exclusivity that's around those particular models uh, for this model year especially, I just want more of it. You know, that's my biggest complaint. I want more of it. I want it more and I want it for longer. I don't want it mid-model. I want it the whole year and I want more <laughs> models and I want more of it. Yeah. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. Uh, as always, if you're interested in a bike in Southern California, hit us up here at Laidlaw's Harley-Davidson. We're just east of downtown Los Angeles. Love to help you out. Uh, if you haven't already, make sure you hit that thumbs up and like the video and uh, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel to see all of our future content. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. We'll see you on the next one. Later. Later.